I'm really embarrassed to show you this. I'm going through old videos and thinking a lot about the early days of how I learned to make video. I thought I would go back and tell you the story of how I got into video and learned and eventually started making documentaries. It's more expensive to live in Hong Kong than anywhere in the world. I'm in Portland, Oregon today for 48 hours. For me, it all started with a video camera that my parents had. When I was in high school, I would take this video camera out and make the weirdest, most horrendous looking short films you could ever imagine. This stuff had no body, it had no use. It was ugly and storyless and just really weird. 8, 2007. But what it did is it started to hone a sense of me looking through a camera, pressing record, and then going and editing images together. And I did it a lot. I mean, when I was in high school, I would film everything. I, again, had no sense of purpose or story or anything, but at least I had my hands on a camera. still horrendous and like worthless stuff but like it represents a kid tinkering with a camera and it represents a lot of time behind that camera. Eventually what happens when you put a lot of time into a camera is you start to think of experiments, little things you could do to change. The big experiment was when I learned how to mask. Basically to take two pieces of, of video and to cut out one of them and I started doing these weird experiments where I would cut myself out and like this one with this water bottle that I'm throwing back and forth. I did this in like 2005 and it was like my first moment where I was like, oh, I can composite two pieces of video over each other. I went to college and brought my parents' video camera with me and continued to make stuff there as well. And That was similar, it didn't really have a lot of story or structure or purpose, but it was still me putting my hands on a camera and shooting stuff and then going and editing it. At college I thought maybe I should be a film major, so I enrolled in uh, the intro to film class, which is the prerequisite for the film program. And in that class I was a bit disillusioned by the fact that we were talking about theory and history and critique of film but we weren't actually making anything. I remember asking in like the second week, like, so when are we gonna like make a movie? And they're like, oh, we, you do that in like the fourth year in one class, you get to like make a movie. And I remember just being so disappointed, like, wait, what? That's what film school is? So after one semester of, of this intro to film class, I dropped out and I was like, no, I'm gonna find something else. I kind of had this idea that it, I needed to grow up and say like, okay, my dreams of being a filmmaker are over and I'm just gonna switch to something more adult. And that's where international relations came in. I had gone on two international trips and kind of caught the bug of travel and I was like, all right, I'll do international relations and kind of give up film. Then I got married to Isabel uh, while I was in college. How's it going, dude? Oh, <laughs> really bad. Why? Uh -oh. oh. And she was also kind of into video and film and internet. And so we ended up buying our first camera together. Uh Man, total bummer. I actually spent the rest of that day in Portland recording the rest of this and um, even hung out with my sister, who's a self taught photographer, and she chimed in. And the footage got. Um, deleted or something. It was all offline when I went into the project file. So I'm gonna finish it up here. I think we left off, um, I went to college, started tinkering around with Izzy. Izzy and I, who you may know as Iz, I call her Izzy very often. 
Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, is. Yes. Yep, I can do it. Okay. All right, see you soon. Bye. So me and Izzy during college started to nerd out about cameras. Ooh, so solid. Wow. The housing is just so much more solid and nice compared to our 50. We bought an expensive camera, expensive at the time for us, and felt the need to like get good at it. And so we actually started shooting weddings, uh, like photographing weddings, which in Utah, it's a really cheap wedding market. And so we were able to like break into it somehow. And it was fun. It, like we just got a lot of time to play with our camera. We would do sh shoots with friends. Yeah, it was just a really good time. We started filming our lives and uh, just for personal documentation, we have all this old footage that we've edited together. And that was just another era of using a camera a lot and editing a lot. At around that time, I also started to see on the internet more motion graphics. 2D motion graphics were like becoming a thing, like infographics that move. And I was like, I wonder if I can learn this. And so I took a tutorial on lynda.com and essentials training for uh, After Effects, which is the Adobe program that I used to animate. And I loved it, I loved it. The problem was my stuff was garbage, like l legit garbage. I mean, like, take a look at this. Just like super bad stuff. Um, but it started off this like interest where I was like, I love making these designs move. So I started playing around and kind of making dummy projects that I could get some experience making motion graphics. So during high school, during college, I had a good amount of experience with uh, playing around, truly playing, not really doing much professional work in video and later motion graphics. How that transitioned into then a professional market and a professional job is a story for another time. And I will tell that story in a video that I'm going to call how I got my job at Vox, which is another big question I get. For now, I want to focus on this, these early days, and give you my two big takeaways of why I think this is important to talk about and why I'm showing you all this old, like kind of ugly looking footage. Number one, you don't need a gatekeeper to validate you in this industry. Meaning you don't need a film school or a certificate or anyone to say, yes, you know how to be a videographer or no, you don't know how to be a videographer or whatever it is you want to be in this space. The skills and the learning of those skills has been so democratized in recent years that if you want to, you can become a, a videographer and the tools exist, the, both the training and the, the tools. Like the camera I'm shooting on right now, it's a Sony RX100, it's literally a point and shoot. And it's tiny, but I can make legitimate films on this if, if I wanted to, and it's a thousand bucks. So the more important lesson here, and the harder one to digest, is that these skills only come through putting in a lot of time behind this camera. There's no shortcut to that unless you're like some weird prodigy child, which those exist, but the rest of us, we have to put in the time. And that time doesn't always have to be serious and, you know, like professional work. For a lot of my life, I've been making not serious, not even good work, but it was time. It was time that I was putting behind the camera and that counts for something. Especially if you approach that time, that large body of time and work as a time to experiment and play with new things. So find ways to force yourself to make stuff. And that can be documenting your travels or your family or your day-to-day -day life. And it doesn't have to go to a big audience or it doesn't even have to be good. Okay, any other questions you have, leave them here in the description and I will get to them in future videos. Thanks guys. Last thing I'll say before I sign off here is that I am gonna start to send out an email to people with is every month that has four things. A Spotify playlist that we're listening to that month, a video that is inspiring us, some piece of content in the world that is inspiring us that we like, and number four, a little update on our lives um, and the course that we're doing and stuff like that. So 
if you're interested in that, go to, man, where do you go? I'll put the link here in the description for you to sign up for that. If I don't, it's easy. You can just go to isharris.com. She's the only one with a website right now. I'm incredibly anti-marketing emails. And so I will promise you now that we will send one email a month with a dependable amount of content. You can decide if you want it or not. It, and we'll make it very easy to unsubscribe if you don't. I have no intention of spamming people because I hate being spammed myself. Isharris.com, that's I-Z-H-A-R-R-I-S.com, um, and you can sign up for the newsletter. Thanks, guys.